Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone, uh, dear colleagues. It is my my uh, pleasure to, to to host you all here today. My name is Mark Corbello. I'm uh, I work for the Ministry of Environment and Climate Action in Portugal right now, fully involved in the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the EU. And uh, within my functions of uh, as co-chair of the Working Party on International Environmental Issues Global, we had uh, in mid uh, February uh, this big event. So the first session of UNEA uh, 5, uh, which was preceded by the presentation of the, the uh, UNEP synthesis report, the Making Peace with Nature. And following this presentation in UNEA 5.1, uh, the Portuguese presidency, well, together with uh, UNEP secretariat, decided to organize this event to, to, to have a presentation to all interested um, communities within the Council of the EU. So we addressed uh, invitations to the working parties on international fire issues on uh, global biodiversity, climate change, international chemicals, also to the working party on uh, forests, as we believe these communities are um, uh, particularly interested in this very important report. I will just make some housekeeping uh, announcements so that the, this session today runs smoothly. So I would invite everyone to keep uh, their mics and cameras turned off uh, unless you are given the floor. Uh, to, to, to take the floor. Uh, our session today will start with a, a brief uh, welcoming words and introductory words uh, by Veronika Sefrakova. She is uh, head of UNEP's uh, office at Brussels. And it, uh, then we will follow with a 25, approximately 25 minutes presentation of the uh, Making uh, Peace with Nature reports. Uh, we are privileged enough to have with us uh, both uh, report leads. So Mr. Ivar Basta and Sir Robert Watson are with us, but also uh, Joita Gupta, who was a member of the uh, scientific advisory uh, group uh, of the report. And of course, uh, Eduardo Zandri as well, as he was a member of the core report production team. So without uh, any further delays, I would uh, invite Veronica Hunt to, to say some, uh, say some words, and then we will follow from there with the presentation. Afterwards, uh, you uh, all participants will be given the, the opportunity to, to put some, some questions. We will see how this goes, as if uh, we have too many requests for the floor, we will take the, the questions in writing, and I will be doing the the, the moderation of the debate. Uh, let me also say that participants are, particip are, are here through the, the Zoom platform, but uh, this event is also being web streamed and can be uh, checked afterwards at our um, YouTube link, which we will uh, uh, place in the, the chat room. So thank you so much, uh, in particular to all the UNEP team and Veronica, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Marco, and I'll be very brief um, because the main uh, floor will be to the authors of the report, but uh, I just wanted to very quickly uh, thank to the Portuguese presidency for organizing this event and, and all the participants for joining in, also for the European Commission for supporting us uh, in, in this work. As you know, this uh, idea came a few years ago um, when um, uh, it was agreed that, that, that uh, it should be the key outcomes of, of the uh, uh, reports uh, should be linked together. Um, and uh, this report was presented before UNEA 5. Uh, Marco, you mentioned uh, it served uh, a great purpose for the leadership discussion during uh, UNEA 5. It was uh, used by the high level representatives uh, at, at UNEA, but also uh, by uh, executive director of, of UNEP, uh, Inge Anderson, and uh, deputy executive director. So this, uh, this report is um, uh, highlighting the, the links between uh, the, the three planetary crises. But I would like to step back a little bit and in, in two sentences just uh, remind that it's very much uh, features in the, in the uh, EU-UNEP cooperation that has been lasting for years and years. Uh, whether it was sustainable consumption and production, climate action, biodiversity, um, mar uh, marine uh, issues, or sustainable finance, and so on and so forth. Most of you probably know that uh, we have renewed uh, the cooperation. Uh, there have been uh, discussions throughout uh, last year 
how to address our cooperation so that it is addressing uh, the, the triple planetary crisis, the new medium term strategy of UNEP, but of course also the European Green Deal. So based on, uh, on these uh, developments, a new annex to the MOU, which dates back to 2004, has been developed. And it is very much based on five key areas. Uh, one of them is uh, supporting the policy science interface and international governance. Uh, the second is enhancing climate resilience and climate neutrality with the focus on sustainable energy. The third one, promoting healthy and productive ecosystems, uh, scaling up the circular economy and resource efficiency and towards a pollution-free planet and better health. So all these five key areas are very much in the report that, uh, that the authors will be presenting. Um, we are now discussing in each, uh, each and single chapter how we are going to bring this cooperation into action. But it is very exciting time for us to see uh, where, where we are going at the moment. So with this, I would say um, a big, uh, big thanks to the EU, uh, which uh, supported the idea of the synthesis report, but also contributed financially. Um, uh, the most important thing is that now we work with the conclusions and UNEA 5 was the starting point, but we are uh, definitely going to use it onwards uh, for, for every uh, possible meeting um, and engagements. Uh, in Brussels, we are starting now with, uh, with this uh, event, but uh, we are going to organize also a session in the European Parliament uh, and, of course, uh, with the European Commission for the European Commission. So there will be uh, quite a lot of uh, events uh, around uh, this very important report. Um, and uh, again, many thanks to colleagues from European Commission that brought us uh, on, on this topic uh, together. Uh, needless to say, huge appreciation to the colleagues that you can see on the screens, the authors uh, of, of, the, uh, of the report, and I'm very, very much looking forward to, to hear uh, the presentations as well. So from my side, I, would, I don't want to delay uh, this, uh, this fantastic event uh, uh, any longer, uh, and uh, I would pass back uh, Marco to you. Thank you so much, uh, Veronica. I uh, wouldn't delay this anymore, so I uh, would hand over to whomever uh, is starting with the, the presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. I think I will start with a very quick introduction. Uh, uh, thank you again, and thanks everyone for being here, and thanks, Veronica, for the uh, opening uh, remarks, which put this nicely into context. I think we have, a, we have some slides that should go up for everyone to see. So while the slides are uh, being put up, the, um, the report, as mentioned, has been developed in the past year, and it brings together a very uh, um, striking analysis of uh, the results coming up from major uh, global scientific environmental assessments that have been released in the past few years. Um, the, the uh, resonance that this report has been having globally has been uh, beyond expectations, I must say. Uh, as you will hear, some of the messages that uh, the authors will present have been there uh, since the foundation of the UN Environment Programme 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, and since the foundation of the European Union. We have been uh, as, as a global scientific uh, community, raising this alarm uh, for uh, a very long time. Uh, but this is now resonating much more. These problems, the same problems that were raised 50 years ago are now becoming more and more obvious. The population of the world has doubled in this past few years, in the past 50 years. And you will hear from the authors why it is so important to take action today. Uh, before handing over, I would really like to thank the European Union for the support uh, that the small team has received. Uh, it has been uh, an honor and a privilege to work on this report. Also, the uh, government of Norway and, uh, and the core resources of the UN Environment Programme have made this report possible. Next slide, please. And I think from here, I hand over to uh, uh, the next speaker. I think it's Eva, right? Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Veronica, for the opportunity to present the report uh, to uh, to the EU Council and the Working Party on Environment and, and on Forests. Um, as you can see, it's uh, this is really 
an, an assessment that um, a synthesis basically of um, of um, of uh, some 25 major global assessments um, it involves uh, some 50 experts from 30 countries um, uh, but uh, also what is uh, perhaps more striking is that it's really based on then uh, all these other assessments uh, involving thousands of experts and all member states uh, uh, and it really demonstrates that uh, the messages across all these different assessments are consistent um, but it also shows that the environmental challenges have grown in number and severity ever since the 1972 Stockholm conference on the human environment and they now combine to to an environmental emergency. Uh, the, the report also goes a step further in uh, than the uh, underlying assessment in the sense that it also presents a, a flexible blueprint uh, uh, for different actors on tackling both the climate, biodiversity and pollution emergencies. So if I may have uh, the next slide, um, this uh, report is also very much uh, inspired by the Secretary General and his call on the world, uh, which is also reflected in the in the um, his forward to the report, um, call on the world to end the, the senseless and suicidal war on nature. Uh, and ending this war, according to the report, means that we have to move from transforming nature uh, to transforming humankind's relationship with nature. And if we look at the left-hand pink side of this infographic, we'll see that uh, over the last 50 years, the world trade has grown tenfold, the global economy has grown nearly fivefold, and the world population has doubled. Yes, average prosperity, by default, uh, or most of these numbers have, have also doubled, but still 1.3 billion people remain poor and some 100 million are hungry. So gross dom domestic product, the GDP often overstates the progress we've achieved because it does not capture the declines in natural capital and it does not capture human and social capital that well either. And what we are seeing is really an increasingly unequal and resource intensive development model that degrades and surpasses the Earth's finite capacity to sustain human well being. So basically, we need to move uh, from where we are today and restore the capacity and adapt to it, uh, as indicated uh, in, in the infographic on the, on the right hand side. And, and the coming decade is really crucial, as we will have a closer look at now. And we are really facing a, ch a systemic challenge. If I may have the next slide, uh, what we now also see is that uh, humans dominate the Earth completely of the combined biomass of mammals and Earth. Uh, human population constitutes about a third and livestock nearly two thirds, while wild mammals from mice to whales amounts to less than 5%. So there's less and less space for other living beings. If I may have the next slide, please, let's have a closer look at the extraction of natural resources and energy, which has tripled over the past 50 years. So this figure shows that growth in global primary energy consumption is largely attributed to the growth in fossil fuels, such as coal, shown in black, oil in purple, and gas, shown in blue. About um, two-thirds of the warming uh, caused by greenhouse gases is due to the carbon dioxide, mostly originating from the fossil fuels, not, not, not all. And we can see that uh, biofuels have stayed sort of more or less constant since even before industrialization. Uh, the, the top sort of blue, uh, pink, and, and green shows hydropower uh, and, um, and, and uh, nuclear power and, and other uh, other um, uh, renewables, and and basically it, it sort of this f figure illustrates the the scale of our dependence on fossil fuels, but it also illustrates why halting global warming is such a tall order. So if I may have the next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, show that three quarters of land and two thirds of the oceans are now impacted by humans. And this figure shows uh, the, the use of uh, uh, ice-free land on earth. Uh, it's adapted from the IPCC land report. One uh, quarter of global warming results from activities related to land use. Uh, and one quarter of land has been radically transformed to crop plantations and other human use. And uh, the remaining near natural land is, is projected to be only 10% by 2050 if we continue on our current path. So if I may have the next slide, please. Uh, the need to address pollution 
and waste was a key motivation for the Stockholm conference. It's still with us. If we look at the production and release of chemicals, we see that it's increasing as indicated by this graph, uh, graph which is uh, basically adapted from the GO6. It shows the use of nitrogen fertilizers in blue and fertilizers entering the coastal ecosystems have produced more than 400 dead zones, totaling an area greater than that of the UK or another example, the Ecuador. Um, so the graph also shows pesticide use in red and chemicals uh, industry outputs in purple. Marine plastic pollution, for instance, has, has increased tenfold since 1980. And some of these uh, chemicals threaten human health and the environment. If I may have the next slide, please, and we have a, a, a closer look at the emission of greenhouse gases. They also continue to increase as shown uh, in this figure. I think maybe we lost the slides. Uh, perhaps we can try to get them up again. Um, and uh, this also means that the, the Earth's and air mean surface temperature has already risen by more than one degree compared to the period from 1850 to 1900. And the warming, as we know, has already led to shifts in climate zones, changes in participation patterns, melting of ice sheets and glaciers, accelerating sea level rise and more frequent and, and intense extreme weather, threatening both people and nature. And if I may have the next slide, please, which would actually be my final slide, um, uh, I'd like to turn your attention to um, uh, a burning embers diagram, uh, which I hope will show up on the screen here. And here it is, um, which basically show the assessed risk across um, uh, associated with climate change. Um, and these risks uh, increase from yellow via red to purple. Each of uh, the five panels here cover different natural and human uh, systems. Uh, a, cover unique and threatened natural systems, B, extreme weather events, C, vulnerability of developing countries, D, aggregate ecological economic impacts, E, large scale changes such as changes in ocean currents. And the bars of each panel indicates the late, four latest IPCC reports with the oldest on the left hand side and the most recent to the right. And the dotted line here basically show how risk uh, of climate change are considered more severe now than previously thought some 20 years ago. So the risks are occurring with smaller changes in temperature than previously thought. And climate change together with other factors really poses a significant risk to nature and people. So with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Professor Joita Gupta. So uh, Joita, please, you have the mic and the floor. And if you unmute, it might help us all. Thank Thanks. you, Ivar. Uh, moving on to biodiversity, what we notice is that biodiversity is declining at an alarming rate. One million of the world's estimated 8 million plants and animal species are threatened with extinction. And if you look in the diagram below, what you can see is the relative global impact of the direct drivers on major ecosystems. And essentially, in blue, you see land and sea use change, showing the largest impact on major ecosystems, followed in purple, which reflects direct exploitation in yellowy orange, climate change, green pollution, and invasive alien species is also quite dramatic and shown in uh, light blue. Uh, if we then move to the next slide, we see that if you look at how uh, we have progressed as a global community in terms of achieving our biodiversity targets, and uh, these targets are provided in the second column and they range from awareness building all the way up to um, uh, using indigenous and local knowledge. Then we can see that two different reports, the IPBES global assessment shown in column three and the global biodiversity outlook shown in column five, which have independently assessed the progress towards achieving these targets. What we see essentially is that most of it looks either red or yellow, which basically means we're not achieving these targets. Uh, the green color shows that we have tried to achieve these targets. And you can see that very few of these targets have been achieved significantly. And this means that there's a lot of work to be done still in achieving biodiversity targets. Next slide, please. In moving to discuss then the relationship between climate change 
and biodiversity, both of which are actually seriously damaged. And if you look at land degradation, we see that these three systems are um, mutually intertwined and they, feed, they have feedbacks uh, to each other. So for example, land degradation and deforestation leads to increased greenhouse gas emissions, increased drought, loss of carbon sinks, while climate change itself leads to a shift in biomes, uh, regional desertification, increased droughts, fire, and regional water stress. Similarly, the loss of biodiversity leads to reduced terrestrial carbon stocks and loss of carbon sinks. And at the same time, climate change itself leads to uh, species extinction risks, ocean acidification, and a mismatch in phenological systems. So basically what we are seeing is that these environmental emergencies are all intertwined and therefore they need to be addressed in a synergistic manner to achieve sustainability. And international environmental agreements therefore also need to become much better aligned in order to be mutually supportive. Next slide, please. Now, if we can present the information in this report and the relationship with the SDGs in a sort of a wedding cake diagram, then what we can see at the base of the wedding cake is the natural resource base. And there, the two major problems are climate change and biodiversity loss, also captured in SDG 15 and 13. This natural resource base, which is affected, then hampers the effects the efforts of cities and communities to become sustainable and at the same time weakens the ability of people to achieve food and water security. And this is through the various production consumption patterns and covers a range of SDGs. This second ring therefore hampers the elimination of poverty and the reduction of inequality and it also threatens human health. In 2018, damages from climate-related natural disasters cost about 155 billion US dollars, and worldwide already, 3.2 billion people are adversely affected by land degradation. Pollution itself causes about 9 million premature deaths annually, primarily from indoor and outdoor pollution, and this also, of course, leads to welfare losses for the global economy. Next slide, please. When we then look at the broader picture in terms of equity and justice, what we can see is, if you look at the x-axis, we show privileged people and marginalized people. And on the y-axis, we show a low contribution to drivers and pressures and high contribution to drivers and pressures or low vulnerability risk and impact and high vulnerability risk and impact what we see is that it is the privilege that contributes significantly higher amounts to um, causing ecological degradation, while it is precisely the more marginalized people who are more vulnerable to the existential risks and impacts of this environmental degradation. And this, of course, creates greater challenges in trying to develop policies that can both reduce vulnerability of the marginalized, but also ensure that the privileged take responsible action. Hence, uh, our message is that there is a strong need to promote a just and equitable transformation. I now hand over to Sir Robert Watson. Thank you. It's very clear that we have a challenge. Um, we are transforming nature but we can become sustainable, but it will require uh, human knowledge, ingenuity, technology, and most of all, cooperation. And with this, we can transform our societies, our economies, and achieve a sustainable future. But it will involve a fundamental change in our technological, economic, and social organization of society. We also have to rethink our worldview. What do we mean by sustainable? What is a good quality of life? This says we need to look at our values and our governance structures. Clearly, 
we have a major shift in investments away from unsustainable investments to more sustainable. But regulation will also be quite important. There will be significant opposition to the transformation that we need, and we have to overcome this initiative from vested interest. There are many who want the status quo to remain. There's an opportunity, and I think Europe, more than any other part of the world, is already taking it, that as we look at the economic recovery packages for COVID-19, this does provide a stimulus to accelerate transformative change. But a very key message is all of these environmental emergencies are interconnected, as you heard earlier, and they must be addressed together. The next slide, please. This is the challenge of climate change. This is a UNEP gap analysis report. And what it says very simply, if we want to meet the Paris target of significantly less than two degrees Celsius by 2100, and in principle meet the 1.5 aspirational target, we need to reduce our emissions by 2030 by at least 45% to be on a pathway for 1.5. And if we are comfortable with a two degree world, which we shouldn't be, then we would still need to reduce our emissions by 2030 by 25%. Where are we? The analysis is very clear. In all likelihood, at the, with the current pledges, assuming all the current pledges are met, the emissions in 2030 will be the same as they are today. In other words, we're on a pathway to three to four degrees Celsius, not 1.5 to two degrees Celsius. And so it's great to have all of these commitments of zero net emissions by 2050. But as you heard before, the time for action is now. The next one, five, 10 years, we must significantly reduce our emissions uh, through very, very strong pledges at COP26. Next slide, please. This also says that it isn't any one action that's going to actually help us protect nature. It's an ensemble of actions that all have to be taken together. Conservation, absolutely critical. Don't lose any more of nature that we've already. Restoration, critical to try and restore some of the degraded lands. Climate action, while it is not the biggest driver of loss of nature today, in the coming decades, unless we get to grips with climate change, it could become the biggest driver of loss of nature. We have to go right back to the five drivers that joy to change and look at all of these pollution, invasive alien species, and of course, sustainable production and consumption, absolutely critical. We need all of these if indeed we're gonna transform the way we interact with nature. And the next slide, please. Really very, very critical is a transformation of our economic, financial and productive systems. In particular, the economic system. GDP, as you already heard, does measure economic growth, but not sustainable economic growth. Therefore, it's crucial that we include natural capital in decision making through the use of inclusive wealth, as came out very strongly in the recent Dasgupta report. We need to eliminate environmentally harmful subsidies, fossil fuels, agriculture, mining, fishing, transportation. We need to internalize externalities into the price of our goods and services. And we need to incorporate, uh, include, uh, we, sorry, the circular economy. It's very clear we also have to change our financing. International financing institutions, banks everywhere, can really stop funding fossil fuel projects, unsustainable monoculture, agriculture, and move us towards a low carbon economy, invest in nature. Please, next slide, please. Clearly what we have to recognize is all of these systems are interacting. The food, water, energy system all interact with each other. You can't think about agriculture without thinking about water or energy and vice versa. Therefore, government departments at the national level and international organizations that look at these differences must work together. It's quite clear that we do need to move 
to a low carbon economy away from fossil fuels, but also there are issues such as a plant-based diet has significant potential to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. That's not to say we all need to become vegans or vegetarians, but a more balanced diet that balances out the amount of plants we eat versus meat would go a long way. It's also clear that investments in energy efficiency, especially if you couple it with the money we can save by reducing fossil fuel subsidies, can really provide significant cost savings, basically. Next slide, please. This, of course, is the issue of today, COVID-19. And the point to note is about 75% of all new infections have their origin in animals. There is potentially up to 700,000 viruses in animals and birds today that could potentially impact on human health. And therefore, clearly what we need to do is reduce the risk of future zoonotic pandemics. The figure on the right just shows you how the system works. The bottom line is we need to transform the way we interact with nature to something like a One Health approach. We need to decrease our deforestation, limit the interaction of humans and livestock with wild animals, and we need more hygienic wet markets. Next slide, please. Next slide. And the last slide says we need everybody to act. We need governments and they can play a key role. They're the ones that can really transform the way we think about our economic systems, our financial system. They can put legislation in place that will stimulate the private sector to become more uh, sustainable. But it's not just governments, it's not just the private sector, it's finance organizations, pensions funds. The private sector clearly is a major player and we've got to make sure the governments, the private sector, the NGOs, we all work together. But individuals can make a difference. Uh, stop wasting energy, food and water. Uh, vote uh, for governments that actually want a sustainable future. And of course, the scientific uh, community is there to provide the information we need, the knowledge we need for better evidence-based policies. So thank you for that. And clearly, we are very optimistic that if we all work together, especially at COP15 and COP26, where we actually need harmonized goals, targets, and even more important actions amongst these two, and of course must work uh, with the groups that are working on the SDGs. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> wow, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Eduardo, uh, Eva, Joita, uh, and Robert, for the, um, well, very clear presentation. I would say that most of uh, participants uh, are quite involved in environmental issues, but uh, as uh, I am, I never cease to be amazed whenever I'm faced with the, the numbers and the, the sheer expression of the, the true dimension of the three crises, uh, climate change, biodiversity and pollution. And um, yeah, so right now we would um, open uh, the floor to any questions uh, participants might have. So we would invite you to, to raise uh, your hands and we will try and uh, give you the, the floor. If we have too many requests, we will uh, take the questions in writing um, in the, the chat uh, function. Uh, but maybe uh, to, 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 start, uh, to, to start this um, Q&A part of our session here today, I would, I would try and uh, shoot out a, a, a question. Of course, we, we, uh, we, we've heard uh, and understand the, the, the sheer dimension of the, the, the challenges we, we have uh, ahead of us. We have heard also from uh, um, the UN Secretary General upon the presentation of the reports of how 2021 is the make it or break it uh, year with regards to all the, the environmental crisis. 
we also heard previously Bob Watson saying that we need to act now. Now, um, uh, we of course in the EU already have uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, actually, uh, with the, the when the new Commission uh, uh, well took functions, they they quite uh, recent uh, right after uh, assuming functions, they they've adopted the European Green Deal and drawing from the European Green Deal, a lot uh, is ongoing right now in terms of legislative production, which tries to to address all of the, the the problems we've heard uh, here today quite well expressed. So my question would go to the international uh, uh, dimension, and in particular the, this year where we have uh, three uh, COPs from the three uh, Rio conventions, so the certification, biodiversity, climate change, but we also have important uh, uh, another important COP uh, from the, the triple uh, chemicals COP, and also other uh, events which are uh, quite closely interlinked with the, the problems we've addressed here to, today. And I'm thinking about the, uh, the UN uh, Forum on Forests. We will also have uh, a summit, UN summits on energy. So my question would be how uh, uh, and what could be done in your perspective from the author's perspective what could be done taking on uh, the, the, the reports? What could member states and parties to the, these conventions do, drinking from the reports, to make the, the, this step and to start uh, implementing, which seems to me that is the, the big uh, missing link here, because the problems are identified. Uh, we all know what the problems are. Now we just need to, to move on and uh, take uh, some decisions, but these decisions until they, they come into the, the, the ground, they, they still take, take a little uh, while. So um, I would like if you could elaborate a bit on how we can take these reports uh, and make our lives easier when we come to international negotiations in these big COPs. Um, I won't address this to any of you in particular, but would like to listen from any of you. Well, let me start and then Eva and Joyita. I would actually argue that we have to get the economic system right. If we don't get the economic system right, I don't think we have very much chance of actually becoming sustainable in the future. And therefore, as I said earlier, I believe we need the two conventions in particular to work together. What are the goals of the Climate Convention and Biodiversity? But what actions can simultaneously be beneficial to both climate and biodiversity and avoid unintended consequences? So, for example, if we can get rid of transportation, energy, fossil fuel, agricultural subsidies, that frees up a significant amount of money that will allow us to become more sustainable if we can if we, the governments can work with the financial institutions uh, to stop investing in fossil fuels so i think some of the actions that could be taken at cop 15 and cop 26 is an agreement across governments of how to phase out perverse subsidies how to truly use um, natural capital in decision making how to embrace a circular economy. So there are many things that government should do to actually move us in the right direction. So I'll just focus on the economic system, uh, but clearly Joyita and Eva could add to that. If I just pick up where uh, Bob Watson left off, um, Clearly, if you can address the economic system, that would be fantastic because that is the major stumbling block. Um, I think that the subsidy issue is important, but what I also notice, and that's not entirely in our reports, but it's in the behavior of the European Union but and also other industrialized countries, is that you're seeing that uh, although the Paris Agreement talks about financial coherence, in fact, most Western countries, as well as Japan, and um, which is a Western um, uh, industrialized country, as well as South Korea and China, they are also using public funds to continuously invest in fossil fuels. So it's not just, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a process by which we are transferring from the global north to the global south, 
uh, technologies in fossil fuel, which will lock them in. And that we don't want to create that lock in in the developing countries, because then it will be impossible to try to solve the problem in the next 20 to 30 years. So I think that is a major message that somehow has to come out that we are consistent in what we do at home, but also how we invest our resources in trade and um, investments in the developing world. That was the second message I want to give. Another message I want to give is that uh, if you think about our aim to move towards a circular economy, clearly that does help to delink a little bit uh, economic development from pollution, but there are also limits to the circular economy. And sometimes the enthusiasm that the European Union puts into green uh, growth and the circular economy worries me a little bit because it might also mean, and as, as was clearly shown by Bob Watson, we do have to change our consumption and production patterns. So in, in that sense, it's not like if we get the circular economy, we can go on with business as usual in terms of production consumption patterns. And I think, I think if you look at the developing countries, they're going to come out pretty poorly out of this COVID crisis. So they will have a major financial challenge in front of them. And the question is, will they use their limited resources hereafter to focus on cheap fossil fuels or will we help them to move out of the cheap fossil fuels towards the renewable energy? And that's going to be a big challenge on the table. I'll hand over to Ivar. Well, thank you very much uh, for the question. And, and, and just to sort of pick up on where my colleagues left it, yeah, I also very much agree that this is really about uh, the economy. Um, and it's it's really a tall order, obviously. I mean, and, and if we look at the sort of international, the global perspective, it's really about sort of safeguarding the the hard won development gains that we've seen, and also uh, making sure that uh, poorer nations, poor people, also um, are allowed uh, uh, the um, ability to to improve their own uh, living standards. Yet still, we need to sort of somehow stay within the capacity of the earth. Um, so that I think really means that we have to look at the, at the, um, at, at the, 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 uh, the uh, go ba back to the so source of the problem in a way, which is our development model and our economic model. Um, and, um, and I think um, then obviously we need to look at the economic system, but also the productive system, especially food and, and energy. But I also very much agree with Joita that we have to look at the whole consumption and uh, that we all as, as, as consumers uh, are, are, are pushing for. Um, I, I think also the economic, I mean, one of the key challenges is also to align uh, actions across uh, many uh, sectors and instruments. And, and this year is, uh, as you pointed out yourself, uh, Mark, extremely important because there's so many uh, high level international meetings taking place uh, and uh, there's an opportunity then to try to use this report and other reports to try to align uh, the measures and, and actions under the uh, under the conventions we also had the opportunity uh, a few weeks ago actually to talk to the gef um, who are also trying to sort of explore sort of how can they as a financial mechanism of the the the, the environmental conventions push for for more consistency and, and coherence across and, and, and to look at sort of how to address some of the more systemic issues. So keeping some of the systemic issues in mind also when it comes to the, the, the next stages under, under, under the conventions and the implementation of the convention, I would think is also a, a, a key uh, issue to keep in mind in, uh, in the next couple of uh, months and, and, and years. Oh, <clears throat> thank you so much. I uh, take it that uh, Eduardo and Veronica do not wish to take the floor, but uh, I believe this was was uh, clear enough, at least to me. We have a couple more questions, which I will read. Uh, so Maria Voigt, she, she asks uh, if uh, you have any specific projects you recommend for enhancing private companies to join the preservation of biodiversity. So this would be a first, and then we have Hugo Schale uh, asking for uh, a bit of clarification of what you have in mind 
when discuss privileged uh, versus marginalized countries, economies, or social classes. So we'll take this in this order. And I see that uh, Sir Robert Watson wants to take the, uh, the floor, so please do so. Yes, at this moment in time, I'm rather optimistic about many in the private sector. Um, the, in the last two years at the World Economic Forum, when they look at their risk register, uh, the year before last, the top five risks to the private sector were all envisaged to be environmental. This year they added COVID-19 and pandemics, but they've really started to understand at the World Economic Forum and the World Business Council on Sustainability, that if they want to be sustainable companies with good profit margins, they need to recognize they rely on nature heavily, many companies, but also they have a footprint on nature and they don't want to be regulated. So I'm actually rather optimistic that the bit, many, not all, of the big multinational companies recognize what they now need to do to be sustainable. So if governments can work with the private sector and they both trust each other, that you can put the right legislation in position I'm very optimistic that we will see some of the major multinational companies in the world today almost take a lead on sustainability, but it does mean partnerships between government, the private sector and the NGOs. And what that requires is trust. There's too little trust between different governments at the moment, too little trust between governments and the private sector and with the NGOs. So one of the first issues is to use a more polycentric governance structure where all voices are being heard, especially including the marginalized indigenous and local community, indigenous peoples and local communities. So one of the things we have to work on is indeed building trust amongst the different actors. And then I think we have a real fighting shot of actually getting this to work. But over to my colleagues. So to respond to the issue of um, marginalized and privileged countries and people, um, one way to look at it is in terms of countries, and of course you're absolutely right, Hugo, when you say that the UN um, classification system doesn't make sense anymore, but uh, it's also important to realize that if you look at the number of people affected by land degradation, it's 3.2 billion people, and it's across the world. If you look at who is dying of air pollution, it is primarily people in uh, crowded urban cities, but also rural households. And even in the UK, we've had a court case now, uh, which is in relation to air pollution in London. So uh, uh, this idea of um, people who are not privileged or marginalized suffering greater is across the board in all countries of the world. And uh, when we talk about the privileged people and their footprints, it's not enough to just look at what we eat for breakfast or lunch or dinner. It's also what happens with our savings, with our pensions, because the, those resources are being invested. And the question is, are they being invested in sort of traditional industries, which theoretically are seen to have a high return on investment, or are they being invested in renewable energies, which in the future should have a higher return of interest on interest? And what we are seeing is that that's not entirely happening right now. And so uh, we need to go beyond the UN uh, storyline and classification. But on the other hand, despite the fact that you have countries on the margin in both rich Middle, middle income and poor countries, there is a core of very rich countries and there is a core of very poor countries and there will be a responsibility in relation to these rich core countries and the poor countries. Well, uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> we, we continue with questions. So we have uh, Aino Vipsanan, which asks that, uh, well, the question is noting that the privileged are responsible for most of the environmental degradation. How do you see this best addressed on a policy level? And then Rob Hendricks, if you have any specific recommendations regarding the role of youth. So I'll leave it to you, thank you. Um, okay, I'll just start off on the role of the privileged and the, um, 
my experience has been, and this is perhaps a little bit going beyond uh, what we have written in the report, is that a number of privileged people, privileged people often don't realize how big their footprint is. And they're almost a sort of a, a feeling that it is the Brazilians who are cutting down the forest and it is somebody else somewhere else in the world who is doing something. And they don't sort of realize that every time they sit in their car and they use diesel or uh, petrol, that itself has a major problem. So I think awareness building amongst privileged people about their footprint is really, really important. And our reports, all our reports at the assessment um, at the global level do talk about the difference in the environmental footprint. That's the first step. And of course, we have to come back to production and consumption patterns. I'll hand over to Ivar maybe to talk about uh, related issues. No, thank you very much. Now, clearly, I mean, th there is a lot uh, we need to do in terms of making people aware of their own footprint and the fact that we, especially in, in the rich part of the world, export our footprint uh, to um, other parts of the, the world through trade and through uh, uh, pollution. Um, we have uh, in this report tried to sort of home in on a bit on as, as Bob Watson also pointed to on the sort of the role of different actors when it comes to addressing some of these systemic issues. So we do have a table, for instance, where we go into the uh, the role of the private sector in the, in addressing climate change, biodiversity, in in uh, in in uh, transforming the economic uh, system, in in transforming the food and energy system, and and the same for individuals and and, and youth. So there are we are trying to sort of the address the world as we see it in a way as as a sort of polycentric world, uh, where a lot of the potential also lies in better alignment of uh, actions across multiple uh, entities in, in society, which are partly um, playing by the same rules, partly by sort of overlapping uh, rules and, and slightly different rules. So, and, and that has very much to do with the, the worldview and awareness of who you are in society. So we still need to sort of probe everyone in society to make sure that uh, we tap into the ingenuity, the cooperative skills, uh, our knowledge, um, and our resources to change uh, towards uh, and to make the, the transformative change that we are we have to have to undertake. So perhaps hand back to, to, to Bob for any further comments on, on the actors or, or any other issue. No, let's carry on with the questions. I think you two have done a very good job on that. <laughs> So thank you so much. Uh, the, the next question was, uh, if you see uh, any specific recommendations regarding the role of youth, I would take this as uh, with regards to other uh, major groups, what would be the, the, the specific recommendations for youth? And then we have a new question from, from Hugo, which is a very pertinent one in my perception, is uh, how do you see uh, the interplay between the ever-growing international trade and the global uh, consumption and pollution uh, footprints? So, role of youth and trade versus uh, consumption and pollution footprints. Please go ahead. Well, on the first one of youth, I think we need to listen to the youth. Um, we need to listen to what their vision for the future is, what their aspirations, but actually get them involved, not just in discussing the future, but being active participants in the future. So I'm very positive um, that youth must be listened to. Um, I think it literally all international meetings, there is a chance for youth to speak. But it's not clear to me governments are truly listening to the youth or, as we've heard before, for the marginalised. So one of the key points we've made is indeed that everyone needs a voice and that does include youth. Now, of course, what we've seen in many parts of the world in democratic society, the youth aren't voting. When, when I, I'm now talking to the more the older youth, 18 years and older, young people in America often don't go to vote. Young people in Britain, I know, didn't go and vote on the Brexit issue. Complete mistake, in my personal opinion. So we need to get the youth to not only talk, but really to energise themselves and be a full part of the political process, which includes things like voting. On the issue of international trade, we really have to look at this very clearly. 
we are a globalized world. Our global trade will only increase in the future. So what we need to make sure is that we are sustainable all the way along the value chain, that effectively, if indeed we have uh, as a developed world, is that country is dependent on agriculture, uh, say biomass, for example, in a developing country, that biomass is sustainable. So again, this is a role for both the governments and the private sector to make sure their complete supply chain is sustainable right from the point of production, right to the point of end use consumption. And this is absolutely quite crucial because at the moment, um, much of the international trade is not sustainable. Um, in the GEO for Youth, we had a whole series of recommendations to mobilize youth to take action and to educate them on uh, the various aspects. But one of the challenges we face as teachers in universities is that while our students are much more aware of the ecological aspects, they also want jobs. And they are very afraid that there will be fewer jobs for them in the future. And this leads to a dilemma where sometimes they will vote for more uh, conservative parties because they're afraid that they will otherwise not get jobs, even though they, they, they realize that there's an ecological dimension. And somehow the issue of employment uh, has to be on the agenda in a way that youth feel that they can still get the jobs without compromising on their environmental uh, ambitions. So that's a challenge that we have to face in the future. Well, thank you so much. We have uh, uh, a new question, uh, which is a interesting one, I, I believe. How do you foresee the effects of emission trading schemes where rich uh, country governments and big corporations are able to circulate emission rights to and from poor countries, distorting the net zero emission targets? Uh, would you have, um, uh, would you care to share your uh, uh, ideas with us on this, please? I'm happy to share my personal views, but I'm not sure if my uh, colleagues will appreciate that. Uh, just to be briefly say that in class, when we discuss net zero emissions and net land degradation, uh, we are very skeptical because the word net can be used to hide a variety of sins. And it also means that within developing countries, that alone, when you talk about North-South issues, within developing countries, they can also quite easily claim net zero because they can uh, compensate their emissions through a whole range of things that methodologically may be inappropriate. So I'm quite skeptical about the net zero. I think it's important to hold on to because it gives us hope. But on the other hand, it can be misused. And um, the emissions trading question that stands over here, my feeling is that as soon as developing countries have to reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is required under Paris, the, the low hanging fruit that uh, industrialized countries can buy from developing countries decreases. And so the potential for the market to be used for purchasing emission reductions, generally speaking, shrinks. But we have to see how that works out in practice. I think Jayot has actually captured it. In principle, I'm not opposed to emissions trading. Uh, I think what we need to do is reduce our emissions as quickly as possible uh, by the cheapest way. But as Jayot has said, if indeed it comes at the expense in the near term of developing countries, then they'll only be left with more expensive uh, reductions. So one, one has to look at it very, very closely. One has to take a, not just a short-term view, of how do we get to net zero, but also a long-term view. So I can see some emissions trading can work, but I think it would have to, it has to be done quite carefully. I know that the IPCC documents are relatively positive about this, and I have been for a long while, but it does need some real careful thought to make sure developing countries are not being exploited, basically. To me, I would much prefer to see a carbon tax uh, put on our uh, fossil fuels, basically. Uh, but as we know, getting a, a carbon tax is not an easy thing to do, especially if you try and harmonize it across the world. 
Well, thank you so much. We are uh, just one minute in it over the time we had foreseen, but we still have one more question. So if we, if you so will, we will still take it. So uh, the question um, goes to whether there are any and which are the critical gaps uh, in international governance framework where additional action is needed uh, over and above of what is currently there already. Or uh, do you think uh, there would be, uh, it would be enough to make what we have more efficient and effective? I guess this also um, addresses one of the, the points raised before by Sir Robert Watson that this year's COPs could have a, a joint or somehow aligned uh, um, target setting, which is, uh, I'm not aware of any such process, so it, this would really be a new challenge. What do we need more uh, on top of what we already have in terms of uh, MEAs, if anything, or with regards to what we have, what can we do to make them more efficient? Thank you. Let me start and then Eva and Joyota. Um, I don't think we need new governance structures personally. I think we need to get them to work together much more efficiently. We need joint actions amongst all of the conventions. Um, the problem is quite often an individual country will send one delegation to the biodiversity convention, another to the climate convention, another one to uh, land degradation, Quite often those uh, negotiating groups don't even discuss their national positions at home. And so you get no coordination uh, among them. And so I think there's no question. The first thing to look at is how do we get better collaboration amongst them before thinking, do we need anything new? That's equally true, of course, and this is where Eva could talk about it a bit more, uh, amongst the uh, assessment processes. I do think that the chemical and waste do need a strength in science and policy interface. I helped work on a document that suggests ways to strengthen the science policy interface for chemicals and waste. So I do think we do, we do need some strengthening in the assessment process there, but we also need to make sure these assessments like IPBES, like IPCC, GO, GBO, work together much closer, basically. There's lots of overlaps on these assessment processes, and I think there's ways to get better collaboration and a more efficient system. But I would simply say, let's analyze what we've got now and ask why certain things aren't as well coordinated as they could be before thinking about new structures. I would agree with that, but I would also suggest that sometimes we need to be more honest and clear in our existing treaties. The Paris Agreement doesn't mention fossil fuels, and by uh, making countries then make their own translation between a 1.5 or 2 degree target to what their fossil emissions can be, that creates enough, a lot of room for um, interpretation, and I think we need to have much greater clarity regarding those kinds of issues. With respect to land degradation, really, it's uh, we need much stronger rules regarding land degradation in addition to chemicals, plastics, and other waste items. Um, recently, we've had a whole lot of um, um, Europe, for example, dumps a lot of plastics and uh, electronic waste, uh, often under the name of recycling or circular economy to developing countries. And we are now seeing, uh, seeing that these countries are protesting against the dumping of such electronic waste or plastics. And so ultimately, Europe also has to figure out what do we do with our plastics? What do we do with our uh, electronic waste? And that requires um, not just incremental change, but radically rethinking what we do with single-use plastics. Over to you, Ivar. Now, I think clearly, I mean, if we look at and what we are doing here in this report is to look at sort of what has happened on international environmental governance the last uh, 50 years. And, and uh, clearly, we've come a long way. I mean, we've developed a, a quite elaborate uh, science policy uh, interface with uh, lots and lots of instruments. But still, I mean, it's not enough to stem the tide, so to say. So we're still facing uh, a, a growing emergency. 
So I think we need to look at all the elements and see sort of how can we strengthen um, the whole uh, the whole interface between science and policies, and it has to be uh, science based. Uh, and I think because we are basically arguing for society to, tra to transform. Uh, well, definitely then the leaders of the world need to know that it's absolutely needed. Uh, so the science needs to be rock solid. And I think there's quite a bit of scope in terms of looking at the uh, better interaction between the different uh, scientific assessments, uh, notably the, the IPCC, the, the IPES and, and the GEO. But I think there's also equally uh, scope for looking at uh, strengthening the interaction between the, the major conventions like the, the CBD and, and uh, UNFCCC, the chemicals conventions have actually themselves done a great job in terms of uh, al al aligning their efforts much more. Um, and, and the same also, of course, goes for the work on forests and, and land degradation. Um, now, when we sort of approaching uh, the 50 years anniversary uh, for UNEP and for uh, the uh, uh, Stockholm conference, uh, perhaps it's also time to look at sort of what kind of instruments uh, uh, could be developed in order to enhance the, the cooperation across uh, the, the structure that we have in place. Um, how can one strengthen the, the ability for countries to commit, uh, ability for private sector to commit, uh, ability for everyone to commit, and and to hold each other uh, um, to hold each other accountable for for achieving the changes that we want to see. And I think I think basically that is in 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 all our interests. And I I don't think that we have finished with the international governance structure. I think it has to and will evolve. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much for this uh, for the presentation, for all the, the answers. I would, uh, in particular, thank, uh, of course, Ivar, Joita, uh, Robert Watson, Eduardo, Veronica, to all of you. Thank you for your time, for the the very clear presentation, and we look obviously forward to to keep on uh, our our contacts. I would just make a, a leave a possibly premature question as of this moment is whether we shall expect any follow up of these reports in the future. We will have similar reports uh, in the years to 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 come. And with this, and with a big thank you to all of you, uh, I would conclude our our session. But to leave the last word to to Veronica if you wish to, to say some final words. So thank you so much to all of you and to all uh, those that participated and watched us through YouTube. So thank you so much. Marco, thank you very much. And thank you, colleagues. Uh, presentations were absolutely fantastic. And the last uh, question and the last answers were very nice concluding to, to this debate. So we very appreciate that uh, we had the possibility uh, to present within within this uh, within this format uh, the report. But what was mentioned uh, during the presentations, and it's quite evident, is that this report should be uh, served um, not only for the uh, higher level meetings that were mentioned, COP15, COP26, and other processes, but but also other sectors. That's the most important part. That we are not uh, talking to environmental representatives, which I think today is the is uh, predominantly um, uh, all of us that are working in the field of environment. But uh, but uh, we should be uh, also addressing other formations of the, of, of the working parties. Uh, uh, in industry, finance, uh, agriculture, and so on. Uh, maybe some of them are here today, but uh, but certainly we are ready to uh, to to present to other uh, groups. Uh, and we very much appreciate uh, this um, this event. Uh, Eduardo also uh, posted uh, there the links to the geo for youth. Uh, so th there also we are going to uh, for the Brussels audience organize uh, some uh, uh, some informative sessions uh, there. But um, as I said, thank you for this opportunity and we are ready for any other uh, possibilities in the future. And thank you uh, to the Portuguese presidency for this. Um, and with this, uh, wishing you a nice sunny day. <laughs> thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone from sunny Lisbon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye everyone.